Let me start up where you ended up, where you ended up. Start off where you ended up. If I heard you right, you said that if we did all the things that we ought to do on health care, we would cut the fiscal gap in 2050 from 8% to 6% of GDP. Uh, no, that was the 75-year uh, fiscal gap in present value. But. Okay. But there's still heard, a big gap. Right. So, so that's what I was going to ask. Even on that fairly optimistic assumption or analysis, you cut two percentage points off the uh, deficit, but you're still left with a deficit that I suspect would be a lot higher than you indicated earlier was kind of an equilibrium level, somewhere under 3% of GDP. So what's the best guesstimate that far out as to what the remaining gap would be and what would you do about that? Well, if you, uh, first, we don't necessarily have to get the 75 year fiscal gap, it, I'm going to frame it that way as opposed to the 2050 deficit to zero, but uh, there still is a significant gap that uh, persists. And part of that, frankly, is going to have to come on the revenue side because we are asking the federal government, uh, and this returns to the 2015 deficit problem, but we are asking, in a sense, we're asking the federal government to perform uh, a variety of functions that are uh, incompatible with the revenue base that we're providing. Uh, there are then, obviously, other changes that could help also. So uh, Social Security is not the big driver either in 2015 or 2050, but uh, removing the actuarial imbalance within Social Security would reduce that fiscal gap by close to, well, a half a percent to one percent of GDP, depending on how you do it. Uh, you throw in some revenue and you're getting uh, you know, within shooting distance of uh, a much more sustainable fiscal course. Okay. And, and I also just want to say, again, unless we get at structural changes in the health system, there is no way to do this in the conventional toolbox. You cannot do this with, you know, just raising taxes or the kind of traditional uh, blunter provider reimbursement rate reductions or traditional spending reductions. You have to get at the intensity of services provided or else the system will ultimately blow up. Well, I suspect we're going to have a lot of questions on that, but before we get to that, let me just ask one more question on the macro context. Um, you've now acknowledged or, or suggested that something significant on the revenue side is going to be needed to deal with both the 2015 problem and the 2050 problem. What's your preference? Uh, what do you think is the right way to go about the revenue shortfall, taking into account, of course, the political realities and what, uh, what is least unlikely to be uh, acceptable? Well, I have learned that it's a lot easier to come up with uh, revenue proposals when you're sitting at IAE or Brookings than uh, to actually get them enacted. Um, so I think the final part of your question is the most important, which is uh, you can design whatever revenue scheme you think is optimal, but the key question is a political economy one. From that perspective, among the very unattractive uh, alternatives, I think the best possible option is simply to allow all of the tax cuts, and by that I, I'm including the middle class ones, the whole thing, to expire when they're scheduled to expire. That would have three benefits. The first is that... Uh, Which is the end of next year. Yeah. Three benefits. The first is that it would basically fill in the gap that is uh, uh, our 2015 problem. If you do something on the spending side, it would raise 1 to 1.5% 1 of GDP, depending on interactions with alternative minimum tax. So it would sort of do the work that's necessary. The second is that it has the benefit of familiarity uh, if... Uh, we have, all that it would do is return the tax code to the form that it had in the 1990s. Uh, so we've already lived through that. It's kind of hard to argue that it would cause economic catastrophe and disaster. It may not be the optimal tax code by any measure, but at least we have experienced it, as opposed to uh, new forms of revenue where it's easy to demagogue and, and create uh, perhaps misimpressions about the, the impact. And then finally, it is the only significant revenue increase that would only require 34 votes in the Senate as opposed to either 60 or 50 and most likely 60 votes. That's a huge difference. Uh, and there, basically there is no other 34 vote revenue increase of any significant size. So to my mind among the incredibly unattractive options, uh, that is the one that has the most 
benefit to and, and would that have enough revenue payoff to deal with this long run perspective as well? It, look, if we got another one and a one, one to one and a half percent of GDP, that's you know, you do social security also. Uh, you're, you're starting to get there. Okay, terrific. All right, the floor is open. Questions both on the macro framework, which Pete obviously knows about uh, uh, comprehensively, but also on the healthcare specifics. Howard, uh, please let's ask, let, me ask, let me ask you, identify yourself, uh, and then fire away. Hi, Howard Rosen with Peterson Institute. Peter, um, you seem to put a lot of attention to this regional differences in uh, medical costs. Um, to what extent can that be explained by differences in demographics and incidences of illnesses across the country? Uh, the short answer is a little bit. I tried to put up that slide from MedPAC that controls for demographics and health status. And what you see is the variation is reduced. I would say if you need a rough rule of thumb, it's reduced kind of by a quarter to a third once you control for not only demographics and health status, but uh, differential costs of building hospitals and so on and so forth uh, across different parts of the country. So the short answer is there still is a huge amount of variation that persists even after you throw in those adjustment factors. Uh, but they do provide some explanatory power, just not the whole ballgame. And I, I, I would also say what's fascinating is, and I've now seen this at a variety of leading hospital uh, systems, it's not just the variation across the systems or across the regions. When you actually put in a health IT system and folks can start to see uh, their utilization factors relative to other doctors, it, the, the variation is often phenomenally large, shockingly large, even from the doctor's perspectives themselves, to the extent that you know initially sometimes they don't even believe it. But there is a huge amount of variation that uh, exists and that with better technology, basically, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And with better technology, again, doctors and hospitals can do a better job of narrowing unwarranted variation. Now, should immediately say there's a bunch of variation that is to be expected and that should happen. But I think what we want to get at is when it's happening just because it's what I'll call the it's just the way we do it here medicine. That kind of variation we want to get rid of. So it, it is not uncommon for a new doctor switching hospitals to see much different behavioral patterns for the same kind of cases. And when asking, I think Zeke Emanuel in the uh, intro to one of his books uh, kind of said, well, why are we employing the test here instead of here? And the response was, that's just the way we do it here. That is what we need to get at. Okay, next question. Stun them into silence, Fred. Stun them into silence. Let me take you up on your invitation uh, to further elaborate on the slide you went through rather quickly, which I think had to be one of the most crucial ones, how you affect the change from paying for volume to paying for results. You had four different alternatives up there, but that seemed to me at the heart of your analysis of reform and what is core to any kind of sensible change. Talk a little more about sure. how you do that, how you change that fundamental incentive uh, component of the system. Well, let's go through some of the ideas. Uh, so an accountable care organization, the theory of the case here is that you're going to uh, ban doctors and hospitals together financially and make them responsible for the all-in care of particular beneficiaries or patients. Uh, as many people may know, the uh, initial regs that have come out or proposed regs on accountable care organizations, uh, that's the right way of putting it. I guess in the, in the uh, question of whether you set the bar high and you know, force people to stretch, or you set the bar lower and you don't get as much res uh, behavioral response, uh, I think it's widely perceived that the initial regs or proposed regs uh, really set the bar very high. And the risk at that point is that if those become final, that there may not be that many participants. So those who do participate, you really get a lot of traction out of, but you may not get a lot of, uh, a lot of participation. I just joined the board of a uh, major hospital in New York, and I think, uh, for example, I, I don't think it's likely that that hospital is going to play if the regs turn out uh, the way that uh, they have been proposed. Can you give us a few examples of current, if there are current, accountable health organizations, accountable care organizations 
that uh, are in this basket? Well, one of the problems is that the term is a little nebulous. So what I just described is the concept. There are some real life examples, but they are they they. Uh, the compensation doesn't really follow the form, and so I wouldn't really call them true accountable care organizations yet. Uh, bundle payments are a payment for, instead of paying for each procedure, you're going to pay for someone with diabetes. And uh, so it's it, almost similar in concept to some degree, but it doesn't involve the banding together of the uh, doctors and hospitals from a structural perspective. Um, let me give you another actually specific example where I think something like the IPAB may be crucial. Uh, maybe six months ago, writing in the New York Times, David Leonhardt wrote up a proposal from Peter Bach at Sloan Kettering and someone else uh, to reimburse new technologies under Medicare for three years. And then if, they have, if the new technology has not been shown to be more effective than the existing technology, reimburse at the rate of the old technology. Currently, we just reimburse the new cost regardless. So he uses the example of prostate cancer, where there are three different technologies, a $10,000 one, 40, and 50. Uh, the forty and fifty thousand dollar newer technologies have been have some lifestyle benefits associated with them, but they're they have not been shown to be more medically effective than the older technology. So he'd reimburse even the new ones at ten thousand dollars. That would that kind of change. You can debate the specifics, how many years, how it's evaluated, so on and so forth. But that kind of proposal would shift the incentives for innovation towards actually uh, making you know medical effectiveness rather than just something that's new. The probability that you could get that through the normal legislative process strikes me as exceptionally low. And, uh, the, and I, I check with the authors whether that kind of proposal, given the constraints that do exist on the iPad, uh, whether that could be proposed by the iPad, and the answer is yes. So done that way, the probability is not 100%. Maybe it's only 20 or 30 or 40%, but it's a lot better than effectively zero. And, and just to elaborate a little bit, you started to do it with your example of prostate cancer, but what is the measurement tool that could be applied to determine whether quality of care has been improved, meets whatever the thresholds are, uh, and therefore uh, implements that concept in an effective way? Very challenging. The measures of quality, uh, as I tried to emphasize up front, are still quite imperfect and uh, and frankly, there's a lot of ambiguity surrounding uh, exactly how we will measure quality in a variety of these settings. Um, but it, it is also worth noting, I'm not necessarily embracing this, but I, it is worth noting there are other uh, systems that already do this. So for example, uh, that's a good example, in, in uh, the pharmaceutical space for drugs in France, uh, what they do is there are tiers of different innovations, something that's a Small improvement gets reimbursed in, in one way. Something that's a leapfrog, big improvement, gets reimbursed in another way, uh, more generous, more generously. So basically, if you're if you've got only tiny improvements, uh, you're not going to get a massive increase in reimbursement. If it's something that's more uh, of a of a, a jump ahead, uh, then you do. And that that system, whatever its imperfections, is already functional. Uh, so. In the pharma space, it's a little easier to measure outcomes and quality. But uh, we will have to struggle with this question, admit, and I admit that it's not where it needs to be. And in the French pharma case, improvement is defined as what? It's based on studies of how the... Depends what the drug is, but uh, you know, they're, they're, in, in the pharma case, you can often, we have, uh, when we do studies of, uh, of effectiveness from, from uh, new drugs also, uh, it is usually easier because there is some and there's some intermediate goal that you are tracking. So you know what is happening to cholesterol levels if it's a cholesterol drug, uh, what is happening to blood pressure if it's a uh, blood pressure drug, and so on and so forth. As opposed to uh, in other settings, it's harder to know what it is that you're aiming for. And the one of the big questions is: Are you are you paying for and measuring process or outcome? So. Uh, are you paying for uh, someone to do the things that we know work, or are you paying for actual observed improvements in health? And the latter is the right goal, but it's often hard to really do given all the noise and other and the other factors that affect health. And at best, I presume it would take a few years oh, yeah. to do the this is, study. Look, another point here. This is not like snap your fingers and we have the new system. This is going to be an evolutionary uh, 
thing over not just years but decades to move towards a more efficient healthcare system. It has to be. Okay. Question here. Ted Trump, Peterson Institute for International and Economics. We have to correct you, Peter. We changed. We have a Peterson in front of our name. Now. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Can I revise my remarks? I'm delighted <laughs> to be at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, that's all right. You've been gone from across the street for a while. Uh, so on the iPad, independent, X, whatever it is, the board, right? I, independent board. Payment board, advisory board. Payment board. advisory board. So I have two questions. One is a broad question and one's a narrow question. Well, a broad question is there is lots of skepticism about it. Now, is that just because they think it will never be allowed to happen, or is there something more fundamental there? Or maybe it has to do with some of the things we were just discussing with Fred. The other question is, to the extent that the process starts, right, and they make a, make a recommendation, is it recommendation by recommend or proposal or whatever it is, by proposal that has to be written down, or do they do an annual report that would be uh, have to be voted down and 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 the veto uh, not overridden. I got to figure out all the way right. I voted up, right? Uh, voted down and not vetoed, I guess is the right way. Uh, or is it, you know, sort of recommendation by recommendation? It's supposed to be, the, in the latter question, it's supposed to be an annual report, uh, all inclusive. Uh, look, on the, on, the, on the question of skepticism, Given, I, I think the key question is this, and the reason I sort of diverted into what might be seen as political science almost is, I think this polarization question is the key challenge, not just for the iPad, but frankly for a whole variety of problems that we face from our fiscal trajectory to climate change and so on and so forth. In that kind of environment, the key question of whether uh, someone, for example, can get confirmed to the iPad, I think is a real question. That, but that, that, that's not a question of uh, the potential on paper. That's a question of our political economy and political will to move forward. Um, but I, I think there is some skepticism that's warranted in part because, uh, frankly, at that point, if we can't even uh, move forward on things that we have legislated, the polarization will have become so dysfunctional or so stultifying that we effectively can't govern. And that is a very deep problem. I think, I, the, just to pause on this for a second, in the face of that kind of legislative gridlock, we really need to be putting in place a whole variety of other measures that allow inertia to help us. And one of the things that may be prom more promising now than it traditionally is uh, about a backstop mechanism or across the board trigger, even if you can waive it, is at least it requires action to waive. And given how polarized uh, the system is, that is, if it's properly designed, the kind of thing that we need to be exploring along with the IPAP and other things where defaults are flipped on their head and they lead to better outcomes rather than worse outcomes. Because in the face of that kind of uh, deeper, more deeply caused, it's not, it, this is not easy to fix. I don't think we can turn back the tide of technology and I don't think we can force uh, people into you know, more, uh, uh, politically uh, diversified neighborhoods, we are going to have serious gridlock for a long period of time because it's structural. And the IPAB members have to be confirmed by Congress. Wow. And how many members are there on board? 15. They don't need all of them, but uh, you at least need a chairman and a, and a majority. Okay. So I think, again, I think that's where the, 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 the skepticism uh, would be warranted, uh, which raises, of course, another question surrounding our confirmation process, uh, the most recent uh, victim of which is my friend Peter Diamond. Yeah. Question there. Uh, Barry Wood, RTHK in Hong Kong. Peter, given your different perspectives in the White House, CBO, private sector, what do you think is the most likely scenario for congressional action eventually on overall deficit reduction? Is it likely to happen in the next year or two, or is it more likely to happen as a result of an event, a bond market event, a collapse of dollar? The latter. Uh, in particular, look, our political system has never dealt well with gradual long-term problems. And given this, and that is, 
very substantially exacerbated by uh, the polarization that I tried to document. Given that combination, the thought that we are going to enact painful policies, I'm not talking about targets, but actual, the actual specifics, when the 10-year bond is at 3.1 or 3.2 percent, strikes me as extraordinarily unlikely. Uh, so if you combine the observations that we're not going to deal with long-term problems before they're crises with the observation that unless we get extraordinarily lucky, we are going to have a problem, you wind up with the conclusion that we are going to deal with the problem when we have significant external pressure to do so. And one way of thinking about that is we've got two different cycles going on. We've got the international creditors not really having any viable alternative safe haven, not wanting to experience depreciation on their existing dollar denominated assets. The cycle can continue for a significant period of time. And that you know, is a large uh, force behind the 3.1% 10-year bond yield. On the other hand, we've got an unstable fiscal trajectory. At some point, we will shift from one equilibrium to another. I don't know exactly what sparks it, but the probability that if we go five or 10 years without taking corrective action and locking in the lower tax base that we currently have, the probability that we create a situation where we effectively flip from one equilibrium to another is much higher than the world's leading economic power should allow it to be. Another question? Uh, my name is Bill McGreevy, and I teach on this topic over at Georgetown. And I like to show the students a little cartoon from New Yorker, which shows the doctor behind his desk saying, I'm a doctor. I can add the term ectomy to any word I want to. <laughs> I, I take it as an example. The medical profession is sort of on top in this country, very high status and the like. Hospitals are very important to people. Doctors are important to people. Somewhere other, uh, absolutely you're right that the high incidence of expenditure in a small share of the population is a big deal, a very important feature. But how do you convince people to think that they should in any way ever question the views that a medical doctor gives them? When uh, Atul Gavandi went to Texas, <coughs> and looked at the high expenses in one city, Allen's, Macau. And then nearby, 100 miles away, is the lowest expenses on a per capita basis in uh, uh, another city on the border. Uh, obviously, something is going on about the cohesion of people in the medical profession in a, in a specific place. If you have a, a situation where the, what we call principal agent problem. The agent, the medical doctor, the hospital, tells you what you need to do. Very hard to argue. It seems to me from the top what has to be imposed is some effort to reduce costs by providing people a way out. I don't know if it means subsidizing the gradual reduction of the number of hospitals or whatever that uh, might be required. But that requires a plan itself, it seems to me. And that's one thing I'd be interested to know, if you see that as a necessary step along the way. Well, let me, uh, let me say two things. Uh, first, I don't think you're going to fundamentally uh, create a situation in which, especially in complex cases, individuals are uh, pushing back hard against doctors. I mean, I guess that was supposed to be my uh, point, my, my personal example from an ICU setting where we had uh, uh, all the you know outside expertise possible and and uh, and even in that case frankly it we were, we were doing what the doctor suggested which brought me to the conclusion that you have to get at it's much better to focus on what that doctor is recommending as opposed to thinking that uh, you're gonna have the doctor's recommendations stay on the same course that they're on and that you're somehow going to overcome that or, or change the path of, of health expenditures. I think that is, can be helpful as a supplement, but if you lead with that, if that's your main theory of the case, I don't think you're going to make much progress. Uh, the second point I would make is there are examples. So for example, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, there is a hospital, uh, Gunderson Lutheran, that basically forces individuals when they become admitted 
to uh, sign an advanced directive, and it gets incorporated into the uh, into the electronic health record there, so that all the providers have access to it. They are now a very low cost provider. What's interesting about advanced directives is advanced directives, which define what your end of life care is supposed to be like, is they're a form of consumer directed health care because the individual is defining what that care should be like. And yet, ironically, most of the proponents of consumer directed health care shy away from that form of consumer directed health care. And it probably would do more than the traditional forms of consumer directed health to reduce to reduce care. Because what you're doing there is the doctor has, and I saw, you look, everyone has been in an ICU or elsewhere sees this all the time. There are, uh, there are paths that a doctor uh, can recommend, and the doctor's kind of looking for guidance on the more intense approach or the less intense approach. And an advanced directive provides that guidance that then informs. If you're, if you're asking what will most likely affect what those recommendations are, I think the advanced directive is the, the most auspicious form of consumer directed health along that dimension. Uh, Pete, I had a recent personal example too that I want to try out on you because I think it uh, reflects a number of the points you've been making. Uh, and I'm afraid it illustrates what's wrong with the current system and why costs go up so rapidly rather than go in the direction we both want. Uh, I've got a mother who's 105 and a half. And she lives very comfortably in a very nice nursing home in rural Missouri. And everything's been going fine since she moved there. Lived in her own house till she was 100 and a half by herself. Went to the nursing home, no aches or pains. She's in good shape. Much to my surprise on my most recent visit to her, it was about a month ago, both the nursing home and her doctor said, well, we really think she ought to start getting hospice care. They don't think she's gonna die anytime soon. But it turns out that the business model for hospice has changed dramatically in the last few years. No longer is it go into the home or have you in some hospice facility because you're going to die, but it's to ease your pre -position. daily concern and call it preposition. Turns out a third of the people in my mother's nursing home are under hospice care. So I said to myself, why is this? Doesn't the nursing home staff take care of her? Well, yes, but they would do better. Same thing to the doctor. Well, they would do better. It turns out that Medicare pays. So from the standpoint of the nursing home, it's additional personnel so they can reduce the pressure on their own people and maybe even lay off a few. From the standpoint of the doctor, it's somebody else kind of watching over her several times a week so he doesn't have to watch over her so much himself. Medicare pays. So their pitch to me was, well, of course you'd want to do it, wouldn't you? because it doesn't cost you anything, and it'll make her more comfortable, and it's got more people watching her, and so who's to worry? Well, as the hopefully devote, devoted son of my 105-year-old mother, that was a persuasive argument, but from my concern about the healthcare system and overall cost, it struck me as pretty bizarre. Uh, am I right? Is that... Is that the kind of thing have? I don't know how yeah. widespread look, this is. Look, I think. Look, but is that an example of Medicare sort of run amok? <laughs> First, I think we're all impressed by uh, your, your, your mom's 105 year <laughs> by herself. 100 and, you have good genes. Um, the broader point here is, without uh, commenting specifically on the economics of hospice care, is the financial incentives, not surprisingly, drive intensity. We have financial incentives for technology and quantity, intensity in healthcare, and that's what we get. Uh, the, the, the even more shocking or kind of frankly just sad examples, I'll give an example without naming the name, uh, we have 20% of Medicare beneficiaries who are discharged from a hospital readmitted within uh, a month of discharge. And no one, if you can avoid it, wants to go back into the hospital. That's unpleasant. Hospital systems have put in place uh, readmission reduction policies, including nurse outreach and uh, com you know, basically just follow-up, that has significantly reduced readmission rates, and then concluded that they can't afford to continue those practices because they're taking such a hit on losing the second admit fees. If you want an example of a messed up set of incentives, 
There you have it. Wow. Wow. Striking and shocking. Okay, are there any other questions? Mike, are you going to the phone? To the are you leaving? <laughs> Mike is no. going to the mic. Yeah. Peter, good talk. Uh, about 20 years ago, we started creating health maintenance yes. organizations. And part of their objective was to step in and control costs. The argument was uh, that uh, there are all of these excesses and so forth, and we will uh, control the cost and reduce, therefore, the, the insurance premium for whoever is uh, paying the premium. Health maintenance organizations did not, in many areas, get an entirely enthusiastic response because, uh, at least in my view, they're do they were doing some of the things which uh, you suggest uh, would be done by these other organizations, which are, in the end, a form of rationing. That is, they were going to say which things work and which don't, and which new drugs are worth it and which aren't, and, and so the, the, the effort is going to be to constrain the availability of certain types of, of care by either hard mechanisms or soft. Well, to say health maintenance organizations didn't seem to have a very popular reaction, and, and part of my concern is whether the reforms you're recommending are going to be sort of the health maintenance organization writ large. Well, they're certainly being presented as such, but I think they are fundamentally different. I think there are two things. First, uh, HMOs emphasized cost instead of value or quality, and that is a related and correlated thing, but a different thing. More importantly, I think hard on-off switches, given our political economy, don't work. So you kind of mush together hard and soft. I think it's much different to say this new technology has not been shown to be more effective than the existing technology, so you're not allowed access to it at all. As opposed to, this new technology has not been shown to be more effective than the old one, and we're not going to pay more for it. So the doctor can still do it, but you're going to get reimbursed at $10,000. Or uh, in the private uh, sector, there's now movement towards value-based insurance schemes, where uh, your copayment might be a little bit higher for the treatment that has not been shown to be uh, as effective relative to something else. That kind of softer approach, now I agree there are certain similarities, but that kind of softer approach I think uh, strikes most people as significantly different. The other thing I'd say is, I'm going to come back again to the core problem. If we're not even willing to use price signals, which is what that's doing, to gear towards quality, then uh, uh, we might as well, frankly, just forget about the debt limit. What we might as well just throw a big party because we are not going to address uh, the core health care problem. And there's no sense in pretending to be virtuous for a couple of years and then having the whole thing uh, fall off a cliff anyway. Well, uh, Pete, on that uh, <coughs> auspicious note, <laughs> uh, let me thank you very much for enlightening us enormously on a whole range of things, but particularly this central problem. Uh, keep up the good fight yourself. We'll try to help where we can, but it sure is a daunting problem. Yes, thank you much. You're great as always. <laughs>